Good evening, and wherever you're joining us from, uh, welcome to Stroud Book Festival 2020. My name's Caroline Sanderson, and I'm Artistic Director of the festival. Now, in my day job as a books journalist specialising in non-fiction, I read a lot of memoirs. Sometimes, so-called celebrity autobiographies disappoint. They really aren't that interesting. But in the case of tonight's memoir in question, that could not be further from the truth. One of them, from Albert Square to Parliament Square, is the memoir that has it all. A working class childhood, Butlins, West End Theatre, ABBA, sex, drugs, prejudice, traveller's tales, nightlife, gay pride, tabloid skullduggery, gay kissing, a shed load of committed politics and more enjoyable gossip than you could shake a rainbow flag at. But not only is this book hugely entertaining, it also gives me hope that change for the better is possible if we fight for it. I can't tell you how thrilled I am that its author, Michael Cashman, now Lord Cashman of Limehouse, has agreed to join us to talk about it. Michael, welcome to Stroud Book Festival. Oh, thank you. What's the mood like in Limehouse tonight? Well, uh, right here on the river, you might hear occasionally fireworks going off. It's not somebody trying to blow me up personally. They're, they're, they're generally celebrating. But, but the mood is, is good. Um, thank you for that beautiful introduction. Thank you for what you said uh, about the book. Um, we're all facing a difficult time, and that's why your emphasis on hope is essential. Um, because without that, getting through the darkness is so difficult. And I, I'm a great believer uh, that when I see a sun setting, I don't see the end of a day. I see a day beginning elsewhere. Um, when I look up during the day at, at that bright, bright sky, uh, I know that actually there are stars that will shine later. And I think having that optimism and that courage uh, and that community, communing one with another, uh, is so essential now. So um, thank you. That feels like such a thought for the day as well. Now, um, you seem to have, in the, the book um, shows that you seem to have amazing recall for all the things that have happened to you. And as I've, I've, I've tried to convey already, it's a completely packed story, a very well lived life. And you tell a wonderful anecdote as well, as I hope we'll discover. Um, what was it like writing this book and looking back on it all? Well, uh, the interesting thing uh, ha about recall um, is uh, I trust memory. Uh, and we know writers shouldn't always do that. But what was fascinating was I did um, my first uh, draft which was was not right at all but but as i went on uh, and then you get questioned by your editors and, and you question yourself i went back and i checked diary entries and notes that i kept because i kept notes over the years a bit like may west once advised someone a lot of people might not know may west was this kind of uh, american uh, hollywood uh, vamp and and she said honey keep a diary and it will keep you um, but what was amazing was going back and, and having what I'd recalled confirmed. Um, and there's a wonderful moment towards the end of the book um, where I find some things that Paul had kept. Um, and when I read them, again, they completely confirmed um, what, I'd, uh, what I'd, I'd remembered. But the, for me, the brilliant thing about uh, writing was letting go, seeing where the, the narrative, as you remembered it and you see it, where it took you. So the early parts of the book in the 1950s in the, in the docks, which was a dark, amazing, exciting place, but a dark place as well, as, as readers uh, find out pretty soon on in. Um, I could smell it. I could hear it. I could see all of the characters and living here, 500 yards away from where I was born, on that beach, jumping from barge to barge at high tide, playing in the, in the mud and the chalk. Um, it, it was all around. But, but, but the courage to let go and the brilliant, uh, uh, two brilliant editors, and then I'll shut up, um, 
the editor-in-chief, Alexandra Pringle uh, at Bloomsbury, um, and, 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 and Cal Kenny, who uh, worked with me on this, Alexandra came up with a brilliant piece of advice, which is a bit like acting. And she, she said, show, don't tell. And it's the same principle that Alan Akeborn, who I wrote two plays for that he directed and who I worked with, he once said to me, he said, what is more moving, an actor trying not to cry or an actor crying? So, so that idea of, of being sparse, uh, approaching it with a very thin, light touch and allowing the reader to go on their journey with what you're offering. Uh, you, you do very much do that in this book. Um, I just I should have said earlier, you mentioned Paul there, your late husband, and we will talk about Paul uh, later on. But what I what I should have also said about this memoir is that it has all those things. but It has this beautiful beating heart, which is the story of your um, your relationship with Paul. Now, um, you, you we just got a little uh, snippet there from your from your childhood. Um, many people watching will will remember you as um, as Colin. Uh, the first gay character in East Enders, and we'll talk about a bit more about that later. And and as I remember, he was a rather urbane chap who worked in advertising. But ironically, it's you who's the real East Ender, isn't it? So, so give know. us give us a flavour of your childhood. Well, um, uh, my dad was a docker. My mum was a proud proud office cleaner, uh, and and they had four sons. Uh, and I always said uh, that if my mum had had four daughters. Um, she would have taken them office cleaning at the earliest age uh, to show them the kind of job that they would go into. Well, my mum must have known I was gay at a very early age because she took me office cleaning. And I used to go office cleaning in all these amazing warehouses and offices that backed on to the Thames. But when I was born, my dad put my, went down to the, the, the dock labour board um, and put my name down so that when I left school, uh, at the age of 15, I would go into the docks uh, like him. Um, and, and, and being in the East End, I, it was it, because it was so close to after the war. It was 1950, the early 50s. Um, and the excitement of these ships lining the Thames and barges and tugs, all trying to get upstream or downstream, docking, um, the, the, the stuff that came from around the world being offloaded into carts or on the backs of strong men. And, and I remember the horse and carts opposite at Buchanan's Tea Wolf standing there with their horses for hours and hours while they were loaded. And you sat there hoping that a tea chest would fall from one of the cranes, smash, and then in the rush you'd get some to take home to your mum. It was exciting. Um, but it was a place where um, where children uh, suffered. I didn't suffer at the hands of my family, but I I, I, I suffered physically at the hands of, of somebody else. Um, and children were brought up then um, to know their place. My dad used to say, children should be seen, not heard. Um, and so you knew that... Um, Adults would always be believed. And so if something happened to you, um, you had to bury it. Um, and burying things isn't good for anyone. Mm. Um, but we had fun. Um, and, and I loved go going up the original um, penny fields, the original Chinatown, to, to get to school. Uh, and those mornings going up there where it was raining and nobody moaned when you got in because your feet were wet because of the holes in your shoes, because everybody else suffered. And that, and that sense of community, that if your mum didn't have a shilling for the gas meter, um, then you were sent along to see if Betty Wood had it or, or Mrs. Donovan. Mm. Uh, and, and, and everybody uh, looked out for one another. But I, even then, I, I knew I was different. Um, we didn't have a word for it. I knew uh, I was attracted to boys and that girls were my friends, and not the enemy. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so very early on, what a lot of, uh, I think, young people do if they have a secret is you hide it. And the best way to hide it was to make people laugh, to entertain them. 
uh, to sing. And um, uh, and that's what I did. That's what you did. And uh, of course, this this um, brings us on to the title of your memoir, One of Them. Tell 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 us the story of why it's called One of Them, because that very much relates to what you've just said, doesn't it? Mm. Um, well, the, the um, as I said, I was this extrovert, always putting on shows for the mums and everybody else in in front of the air raid shelter in our huge council estate called Garford House, with all these other places called Jamaica House, Wynwood House. It was incredible. In one part of the book, I say, we were all shapes and all sizes, and there was Josie the prostitute, because Josie used to work her trade around the housing estates and around the docks. Um, And on this particular afternoon, my favourite aunt, Aunt Eileen, she was my favourite aunt because she had this magical way of suddenly having teeth and then no teeth. Um, And... And my mum said to her, she said, dance for Eileen. And they put on a record. Um, sh- and this song started. And I jigged and I jumped like the, the, like the Tiller girls at the London Palladium. And they were laughing and laughing. And I heard my mum say, I think he's one of them. And my heart stopped. I thought they know. They know I'm different. They know. They know. And I wanted to say, stop laughing. Stop laughing. Don't hurt me. Mm. But of course, the song finished. They never said another word. But I think that was the moment I realized that I had to hide it. Um, And years later, when I came out um, to my mum, I came out to my dad in difficult circumstances. um, And I came out to my mum and my mum went, I've always known. She didn't say, I've always known you were one of them. But one of them was how queers were described. They say, I think he's one of them. Um, It was never, the word was never used. Um, So, um, and it seemed to me uh, that really I was one of them. And now in the House of Lords, I've become one of them. (laughs) Yes. Well, I mean, you know, it's... um... It's interesting, isn't it, though, because you're, you know, you talk about your, your father going down to put your name down as soon as you were born to go into the docks, the same same as he had. Uh, and yet when you, you know, uh, um, uh, the first part of the book is you, you were, a, you became a child star. You were on the West End stage. You were in one of the first productions of Oliver, weren't you? I mean, that mm. such a wonderful musical, <clears throat> o- 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 Oliver. Um, and I mean, I had no idea that you'd had this this amazing acting. I knew obviously you'd had a long acting career, but I hadn't realised it had started, you know, um, when you were a child. And your parents seemed to have been, you know, uh, you'd, you'd think that they would be so out of their sort of world that they would, but that they were really quite supportive of it, weren't they? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, the, the incredible way, um, I, the incredible way, I became that child actor at the age of 12. It shouldn't have happened. Um, and I always say, if I hadn't failed my 11 plus, if I'd succeeded uh, my, with my 11 plus, an exam I didn't even know I was taking, by the way, um, my life wouldn't have panned out as it did. The fact that I went to that secondary modern school, I won't tell viewers how it happens, but the fact that I was discovered there, um, and, uh, and going off that day, I'll never forget, we, my mum had to take me. And, and first of all, the man was banging the door down. My dad, this talent scout, my dad wouldn't answer it. He said, now it's trouble or, or they're after money. So eventually, this talent scout um, was let in uh, and convinced my father uh, that they should let me audition for Oliver. And off we went to this agent in St. John's Wood, London, uh, and I describe it in the book. It was incredible. And we got there and they said, what are you going to sing? Except the agent was blind and his partner was was uh, was seeing. And, and he, the blind agent said, how tall is he? And he said, yeah, he, he's the right height. Don't worry. And what's he going to sing? So they said, what are you going to sing? And I said, oh, I'll sing you. Uh, I'd love to get you on a slow boat to China which was uh, uh, Lou Clench's favourite, a woman that I used to work in her shop. So I sang this song and we finished and there was silence. And we all looked to the agent, the blind agent, who was looking at something on the ceiling. So we all looked there. And then he went, yeah, he'll do. Off I went, auditioned for Oliver. Um, 
and it changed my life. Uh, and, and and also, Caroline, it it changed me. It, it allowed, because I knew I was gay, I knew I was different, it allowed me to be somewhere where I felt I belonged, that nobody judged, that you, you were there, it was rumoured, but I heard my dad say, he said, I don't want him going on the stage, it's full of queers. And inside my head I thought, well, oh, that'll be a nice place to be. And, and of course it wasn't. It was another one of those myths. But, mm. but there again, uh, there were a lot of predatory um, men in particular. Um, and uh, something happened to me uh, that continued for years. Um, and uh, some, somebody said to me, the, the, the Lord's lovely um, law lord, and he said, you've been really brave with the way you've discussed some things. Um, and I said, well, you, if you don't own the dark parts, they end up owning you. Uh, but, it, but it's more important that if you're honest, you say to other people, no matter what happens to you in life, if you have the courage, the courage to be loved, uh, the courage to love and to be yourself, you cannot help but achieve your own potential with a lot of luck, but accepting everything that happens uh, and not becoming uh, a victim, but becoming a victor in order to encourage others. Mm. I'm getting exactly. serious now. It's because of all these fireworks going off. <laughs> As so much the trajectory of the book, though, um, and and you have indeed been very brave, I think, in 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 many parts of the book. Um, some people would say some of the bits are outrageous. I mean, with well, yes, I Elizabeth mean, Taylor and Kenny Parry. Um, I was just coming on to Kenny Parry and and Liz Taylor actually, um, because yes, I I, uh, <laughs> I was reading the bit about. Um, oh, just tell us about Kenny Parry. Well, Kenny Parry, in fact, there's a little bit in the book. Um, there we are, uh, one of them. There's a little bit in the book. Kenny Parry was a famous character actor, and um, he um, and he was outrageous, and he had this wonderful voice. I'll try and find a bit so I can, uh, so, I, so you can get his voice. Uh, and uh, so I turn up at his flat because I just ended this wonderful, wonderful nine-year love affair, and I, I knew that if I didn't leave, it would destroy me and it would destroy Lee. And Lee was eight years older than me. I met him in that illegal gay scene when I was 16, when it was illegal to be gay. Um, anyway, so I, I talk, talk about how I turn up and I press the buzzer and I say, uh, as an admirer of his camp and his talent, I was allowed into his hallowed halls. I rang the buzzer, the front door of the building was electronically released and case in hand, I made my way down the stairs to his flat. At the foot of the stairs, I saw the bottom half of his voluminous figure. Is that you, Alice? I replied that it was. All of his daughters were called Alice at some point in their incarnation with him. He didn't wait for me, but turned into the flat with the statement trailing behind. Spirit has sent you here for a reason, dear, a reason. I closed the door behind me. Don't put the bolt on, I'm expecting trade, came the instruction from the living room. Trade was the term used for casual male sex. It being market day, he expected one of his many callers. I stood in the sitting room in which photos of Kenny with the famous and the infamous bedecked the walls. Spirit tells me you're on a journey, Alice, a journey. Spirit had obviously noticed the suitcase hanging from my right arm, too. Anyway, there you go. But he was a famous actor. He'd worked with all of the greats, but he was also a clairvoyant. Um, and people like Dame Eileen Atkins, um, Sean Phillips, uh, were amongst his uh, aficionados who would phone him up. And, uh, and he had a Red Indian guide, and he'd sit there and he'd go, yes, I've got him now. Yes, he's here, dear. And, they'd, and he'd start a conversation with this guide. But, of course, you only heard one side of it. And invariably, the side that you heard turned blue. He was an amazing uh, character. And, uh, and it was while I was staying at uh, Kenny Parry's uh, that another uh, pivotal 
period in my life uh, began, where I went on this incredible journey that, uh, that saw me giving up acting. Mm. Yes, well, maybe we won't spoil that bit. <laughs> I, I tell you, this book is yes, <laughs> it's complete. Um, should we? Should we just? Do you want to just um, tell us about Elizabeth? You encounter with Elizabeth Taylor as well, because I, I love uh, that well, too. Uh, I, I won't give too much away, but no, um, don't give too much away. I, I did uh, a brilliant. The the my twenties, uh, I I went from really um, success to success which is why when I made this decision, mid-twenties, everybody thought I was mad. But I did a big film with David Hemmings uh, called Unman, Wishering and Zygo, and I was one of the co-stars. Uh, and then on the strength of that, I was being chased by a big international agent, uh, and, uh, and I was offered a film uh, with uh, Elizabeth Taylor, Michael Caine, and Susanna York. There were only six of us in it. I had about like, three scenes. Um, <clears throat> and... Um, uh, 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 working with her uh, was incredible. Anyway, on the on the on the last day, I said to her, "Would it be possible to have a, a photograph taken of us together?" Because I'd I'd asked technicians before, and everyone said, "No, no photographs, Mike. Now Elizabeth doesn't do photographs." Anyway, she said, Sh "Sure. Uh, when's your last day?" And I said, "It's now." And with that, all the studio lights went off because the, it was the day's filming at an end. And she went, let's have some light around here. And the, the director came over and went, Elizabeth, what's, what's going on? She said, it's Michael's last day. I need the lights of the studio back on. Anyway, this command reverberated around the studio. The lights went back on. We did the photos and it cost the studio thousands because we went into overtime. Um, that was the style of a superstar. Nobody argued with Elizabeth. And you can see the resulting photo in the book. <laughs> the, and you can see. A very expensive photo. <laughs> but I've got hair. This, this amazing <laughs> hair. Um, yeah, very expensive photo. Um, now, you, you can probably tell that we're going to be jumping around because there's just so much we could potentially talk about. But um, 1985, I think it was, we're going to jump forward a bit. You joined the cast of EastEnders. Um, and as we've was already mentioned, um, and in a way that 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 character is something that I feel we can now look back on with, you know, kind of nostalgia. Um, mm. But at the time, it was such a groundbreaking thing. And actually, for you personally, it put you in what turned out to be a very tricky spotlight, didn't it, actually? Yeah. Well, it, it was at, uh, actually 86. And it's, it, it, it's worthwhile. It, uh, the reason you're thinking is 85 is because it was at, at the height of the AIDS HIV scare. Uh, and people, it's always context. People need to remember that uh, AIDS and HIV was uh, represented by the media no, the tabloids in particular, as a gay plague. People were told they could catch it by sitting next to a gay man, living in a house or, or a flat uh, adjacent. Um, the myths and, and, and the stigmatization was terrible. So the BBC deciding to bring into their, their most popular show, it had been going about eight months, I think. Uh, the fact that Julia Smith, the original producer and Tony... Uh, Tony Warren, the uh, uh, the co-creator with her, that they took this decision to bring in uh, Colin, a gay character with a young working class boyfriend, took amazing courage uh, when it was revealed on screen. And it was clever because what they did was it wasn't until three months in that you realized Colin was gay. So you got to know him mm. through his relationship with people like uh, Doc Cotton, Pauline Fowler, um, uh, Den and Angie in the pub. So uh, when it was revealed, um, there were questions in Parliament as to why there was a gay character with AIDS and HIV swirling around the country in this show. Um, the front page of The Sun had my photograph. This is before I'd even appeared in it. And the headline was East Benders. Um, the reporting uh, and the, the tabloid... Intrusion, in particular, 
uh, was at times unbearable. How Paul put up with it, uh, I don't know. They, and I, I mean, I, they could have cast a straight actor and actually, I well, think, had intended to. So, so it's absolutely. a kind of, you know, it's it's the thing of not only that, that this fictional character getting all this sort of attention, but, you know, you were really throwing yourself into the, you know, I, I, I don't quite how to describe it. I mean, it was in a way, a hugely brave decision to take that part on. I mean, amazing opportunity, but... Well, it was... You're right, they tried to cast a straight actor, and Julia Smith said to me, we've been trying to cast a straight actor, but every time we think of the, the part, we think of you. Um, and when they offered it to me that afternoon, when we sat down and talked about it, I said, I've got to ask Paul, I've got to ask my parents, because I knew but, that there would be intrusion. But... Mm. No way was I ready for it. Mm. And then when we had the kiss, which was actually a peck on the forehead, there were calls for the characters to be taken out of the show. And if the characters weren't, then the show could be, should be taken off air. Um, there are some journalists who are around now who wrote some pretty awful things uh, at the time, and the words were not ple pleasant. Um, and I won't tell people how it happens. Um, but it's in the book, uh, one afternoon, a brick came through our window. Uh, it wouldn't be the last brick that came through the window. But interestingly enough, uh, although I was placed on a, a far-right hit list, um, I had threats, the public were much, much more supportive and actually more advanced uh, in, in their acceptance of Colin, much more advanced. And letters that I got, one wonderful letter from a woman when she said her two sons, who I think were about eight and ten, or maybe a bit younger, had watched the Sunday show with her. And they said, why is Colin kissing Barry? And she said, I said to them, as mummy loves daddy, so Colin loves Barry. And I just thought, that's it. That's why they hate what we're doing, because it's about love. And they're obsessed with the depiction uh, of sex. Um, and it was a very, it was a dark time, uh, but being in that show, uh, the government bringing in the first anti-lesbian and gay bisexual law in a hundred years, uh, and me knowing I had to campaign against that law called Section 28, um, took me on a trajectory, uh, a journey, uh, which I think led me into founding, co-founding Stonewall, into the European Parliament as the first openly gay member of the European Parliament for the United Kingdom, and arguably uh, into the House of Lords. Um, and yes. and so, I, so I've, I've been very fortunate in, in that, yes, it, it was difficult, but I had Paul. And, and that's another reason I wanted to tell the story, because often, and oh my God, he suffered, Caroline, Often people who are considered successful, their partners are thrust into a shadow. And as Paul once said, and there's a, I've got the cutting framed up on that wall, he said, once you're outed as a gay couple, once you're outed, they're no longer interested in you unless it's scandal. Um, and uh, and we, I, I couldn't have done, well, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be me without him, that relationship that we had, the fact that I tried to push him away, that, because I believed if you loved me, you had to hurt me, you had to leave me, you had to be bad to me. I had, and, and so it, it was his perseverance. You know, there were 13 years between us, and there's a wonderful moment toward the, towards the end of our lives together. When I look at him in the middle of a party, in our, our flat, and I thought, my God, that young, young man, look at him. And then I realized that really he was never a young, young man. He was a thoroughly intelligent, decent and mature thinker who got me through so many battles 
and got me out of so many scrapes, as the as the readers will, um, well, uh, you will know, find out. I, I just, you know, when I was reading again, you know, the, the story of how you met, you met when um, Paul was working at, but you talked about Scarborough and going there, because um, you'd written two plays and Alan Aitbourne put them on um, in Scarborough and you met Paul when he was 19, I think, and he was working as a Butlins red coat. And people can read more about all about that in the book. But what <coughs> I wanted to say was that, you know, you're very honest about you, you were together for over 30 years and, and, and you got married when as soon as you were able to get married. And it's a wonderful love story. And very sadly, Paul died in 2014 of cancer. And it's a it's a wonderful story. It's a sad, very sad story. But, you know, I, I'm so buoyed by because when you think that when you met, your relationship was illegal yeah. and you went through so much together and, you know, in you know, there's many things wrong with where we are now, and perhaps we'll talk about that in a minute. But, but just the, the all the things that you 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 weathered together, I guess, is 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 very 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 buoying, and the, and because it sort of represents the progress that you yourself have fought so hard for. Well, uh, it does represent uh, the progress. I think there are times in the relationship that I write about between me and Paul, where you see the strain, where you, you see that that actually its effect on him, uh, him being ignored, him being shunned. Um, but but the, the progress, and that's what you realise, that's what I realised that, that afternoon the brick came through the window. Um, it's at moments like that when you become stronger because your hand li- literally reaches down through over thousands of generations to other people who were attacked because they were different or because they stood up and said, you cannot do that. And so the progress that has been made, and there needs to be more, um, is progress that was started over a thousand generations ago. And because of that, it's a legacy that we must promote and it's a legacy that we must defend and we must never surrender the rights of others as sadly some people are doing now and sadly some lesbians, gay men and bisexuals are surrendering the rights of trans women and trans men who only want to be themselves and live their lives. Um, and. Ian McKellen, you know, my, my, my best friend, my neighbor, I mean, we, we chat about this and that, that there are dark things on the horizon. Thankfully, I'm in the House of Lords and you don't have to get reelected so I can be a real mischief maker on that front. Um, but he said, he said, we must never forget that, that the, the, the Germany of the early 30s was the place where people went to be themselves, where people went yes. to live, where homosexuals from England Christopher Isherwood went so that they could live their lives properly. Now, I'm not saying there's a comparison between here and Berlin then, but I, it's just a vivid reminder that liberal progress is never an unbroken, continuous line. And, and the fact that we call it liberal progress, in a way, is wrong. It, we, we should always talk about equality, and those who deny equality uh, are the perverse um, concept that we all stand the one with the other, equal to each other, not better than, is for me the starting block of uh, of civilization. Mm. I do go on. I do go on. No, you do, but wonderfully. <laughs> I well, yes, and and I I, I remember that um, you know we I was like when when we first met I, I I was interviewing you for the magazine that I write for and. Um, you know, we were talking, uh, uh, it was about a year ago. So and I, I found something that I wrote in the piece because, of course, we, we, we met in the House of Lords. You gave me a wonderful tour and and it was it was lovely. And then we sat in the canteen and we chatted. And um, of course, we, we you were um, 1999, you were elected as uh, an MEP to the European Parliament. And so we talked about your absolute belief in the European Union. It's it's clear from the book. Um, and I And you said to me, In 1939, Britain understood the concept of solidarity. Unless I stand with you, I will be next. We don't get that now. We somehow believe that by being on your own, you become stronger. You don't. You become more vulnerable. Absolutely right. Um, And 
and we are going down that path with a belligerence. I have to say the, the belligerence and the, the English exceptionalism um, has been sadly part of the way we dealt with the early threat of COVID. Uh, the, uh, the bellicose statements that we will be world beating, we will do this by June. You know, the only way you should lead people is with absolute honesty. Take them in on what you hope for, but let them know the reality of what we deal with. And the fact that we are progressing to finalize Brexit, when we are looking at the biggest recession, certainly in my lifetime, and certainly the biggest recession since potentially the 1920s, uh, when we are looking at mass unemployment, uh, people being evicted from their homes, when we are looking at access to medicines, possibly breaking up the, 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 the United Kingdom, the fact that we go down this destructive path is lunacy that even a doctor couldn't certify because it goes beyond the imaginable. And what's happened today, Joe Biden elected, we, uh, the, the current president uh, trying to deny it, um, Biden has very strong ideas uh, about this internal market bill currently going through the House of Lords, uh, which will break international law. Um, and I don't want to be led by lawbreakers. I want to be led by people with, with vision. I don't care which party, because when it comes to doing the decent and right thing, no one party has the monopoly. Um, so I hold that same view. Uh, you join a trade union, not because you're all the same, but because you cede power so that you can collectively get a better deal. And if one of you or one factory is threatened, the clout of the other helps to protect the vulnerable. It's called society, society connection. Sorry, but it's it, the, no. throwing away, throwing uh, and the way we depict uh, the Council of Europe, the European Court of Human Rights, set up by British architects, set up by Winston Churchill amongst them. And we denigrate it and we allow it uh, to be to be cast in the worst possible light, whereas it's a beacon. It's a beacon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, people would think I'm passionate. <laughs> you said, I am. You, I you am. said well, it's, you are passionate, but it's always... A joyous experience. <laughs> I've written down something else that you said to me that day because it's always, yeah, you know, we talked about many serious things, but it's always joyous. You said, I've got plenty of armour in my closet. I'm not in there, so there's plenty of space. <laughs> <laughs> it's the one where I didn't give you a quote. My mum, my <laughs> lovely mum, she had lots of lovely quotes. Uh, 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 and one day when I was out of work as an actress, she went, Don't worry, son, something will turn up if only the toes of your shoes. It's a lovely image. You wait so long that you, the toes of your shoes turn up. Um, yeah. So but I've you got were, lots of armour. <laughs> but you were talking, excuse me, We were talk, you were talking there about, um, you know, connection. And I, I'm going to embarrass you slightly now because when, when you gave me a lovely tour of the House of Lords and we went and we saw the wool sack and we saw the amazing paintings and we saw the throne room where you were, you know... Um, made a lord and uh and it, and it and it was lovely and then we went and sat in the canteen but my my abiding memory of that day is that you spoke to everybody you spoke to the lady who was dusting the books in the library and you knew everybody's names you knew the the lady on the till in the cafeteria you spoke to her in french because she was uh french african i think and yes. you know i i just thought you you know you are there you are lord cashman of limehouse and you you are just it's that connection and and it just made me think the extent to which we need people with, you know, some humility, but also people who haven't forgotten, you know, like you, what, what it's like to grow up, you know, in a working class East End, but also politicians who can connect with people. I think it's it's just so important, isn't it? Well, I, I, for me, it's important to realise that, uh, and again, the, the pandemic has taught us that, hasn't it? I want us to come out the other side of this pandemic changed. We need to reprioritize so that the people who clear our bins away aren't suddenly forgotten and paid meager wages. 
um, that the cleaners in the NHS and the porters, as well as the doctors, the people who drive the, the buses, who, who deliver the food, uh, the people who work in those stores. We need, be, we need to realise, and it's the one thing I think probably coming from my mum going into those awful offices that were wrecked and filthy, going into Psalm Studios where Elton John works and, and having to clean it up. And I said to Elton once, I said, my mum used to clean Psalm Studios where you worked. He went, did she? So I said, yeah. She said, she used to say you were a filthy bugger. <laughs> but, but what it teaches you is that none of us act alone. We can't do what we do. I can't do what I do in the House of Lords without all of those people. And they can't do their job without me. We are interconnected. And the more we talk about that, the more people will feel they belong. And, you know, sometimes elections throw up nasty results, often when people feel they don't belong. Um, and it's just, it's, it's probably the way I've, I've been brought up. My brother's... Uh, uh, are the same um, and uh, yeah so I'm lucky really um, to be able to see the people that, that I work alongside now I should have said at the beginning that we're we're very um, we're very happy to take your your questions, so you you can put them in on the on the chat where you're watching on YouTube. I've got one here. Um, this is a t question from Sharon, who would like to know how has your career as an artist informed your career as a politician. Ah, absolutely dynamically, because as an artist, um, you have to engage your imagination. Um, uh, and as a politician, what I always ask uh, is to say, imagine that is you. Imagine you're standing in that person's shoes. Imagine you're standing in the shoes of the father and mother who get into that dinghy on the other side of the channel with their children. Imagine it is you and imagine what you would want to happen to you. And, and so as an artist, you, I engage in politics, my imagination, as much as I can, because it has the courage to place me in parts of the world and in some people's experiences that I might not otherwise be in. Somebody said to me, some of the work I was doing in the European Parliament, he said, you know, life is, is a lottery. He said, but the lottery begins where you're born. Um, and those of us who are lucky enough to, be, to, to have been born in this country start with a great advantage and just occasionally imagine what it's like to be without family, to be without home, to have no option but to flee war and terror and famine imagine that and then imagine what you would want to do to make their lives better i i love that emphasis on the imagination because you know all the arts and obviously the arts have been an area of of, of some focus recently um but when we think of, of theater where you started and and film and television and books you know they all encourage us to yes. imagine and and i started um the first day of this book festival i quoted um the turkish writer and i know you're very fond of turkey oddly enough aren't you as a country although yeah. difficult times um but the turkish writer elif shafak and she said that the purpose of literature is to make the invisible visible and you know that's that that's what it's all, all, all about and 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 the role of books in taking us out of these rather restricted you know, times that we're living in. Um, well, Caroline, that is what happened to me as a seven-year-old at school, at, that, at my primary school, where Miss O'Sullivan said, read, read aloud to the class. Words that, 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 that went from my eyes into my head and had a colour and a sound that created other worlds. Um, and, and even now, uh, I'm staggered by by what writers and artists and directors and creators do, especially at the most difficult times. Mm. Well, because of course you, I mean, this isn't your, your, your first piece of writing. I mean, you've been writing for a long time. You, you wrote plays, as I think we, we touched on, didn't you? It's always been yeah. part, of your, part of your sort of artistic career, really. 
But that love of words, and again, going back to Sharon's question, it, it is the love of words um, that allows you uh, to, to communicate. Interestingly, um, I, 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 and I'll, I'll be very quick, I, I did a debate in the House of Lords. Um, I'd been there about, about a year, and I spent that morning uh, with my brother who had to have a dis disability reassessment. The inhumanity of them is another thing. And so I got to the House of Lords and I thought, oh, I haven't got time to go upstairs and get my notes, so I'll, I'll just, I'll wing it. Anyway, I, I did my 10 minutes, because I listened, sat there, listened, and um, got some lovely reactions from the other Lords. And as I passed one of the, uh, the, the Law Lords, he looked at me and he went, Stow the show, dear boy! Stow the show! And I said, it's not a show. He went, sometimes it is. <laughs> but what he meant was, you've got to put over what you believe in. Um, but, but once you've been an actor, when you get it right, people say, oh, well, he should. He used to be an actor. And if you don't get it right, they say, well, you think he would have got it right because he used to be an actor. So, um, so yeah, Sharon, they, they, they all connect. Yeah, it's, it's so fascinating how you've used those skills, the House of Lords. And I, I think I remember saying to you as well, it's the, in, in, in the Lords, it's also that sort of power of de de debate so that, you know, this thing about you have differing, very differing views, but somehow mm. the Lords is a place where, uh, you know, consensus is reached, isn't it? Yes, it's... Well, it, it has to be. because, And that, that was why having spent 15 rather brilliant and in interesting years in the European Parliament and having a whole range of jobs, including uh, writing Sh the Schengen border code on the free movement of people. One wonderful thing I did. But... The European Parliament, no one party has a majority. So you have to work across the parties to build up a consensus. Um, and, 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 and that is crucial. Equally in the House of Lords, no one party has a majority. So, so, so you go into the debate, you listen to the debate, you make up your mind. Now I, I resigned from the Labour Party Sadly, after 45 years membership uh, over the anti-Semitism and, and over Europe, facing both ways then on the most important issue facing this country since the Second World War. Uh, so I sit as a non-aligned peer. And you, you, like others, you make your mind up how you will vote. But it's a much more intelligent way of working uh, and, and, a much, and therefore a much more satisfying way of working, of saying to the other side, that's really interesting, I want to work with you. You know, I'm working with uh, the Home Office Minister at the moment uh, on, on a piece of legislation uh, on disregards and pardons for historical um, uh, homosexual crimes that are no longer crimes and that have been overlooked. And there's something else I'm, I'm working on. Always reach out the hand to work with people. If it's rejected, that's fine. But it's it's a it's a good way of working, and I think the com the House of Commons uh, uh, could take a, a lesson in that respect. Mm, very much so. I see you um, when I think about you know that the 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 subtitle of your book is from um, from Albert Square to Parliament Square, but it, it, you know that's only part of the trajectory. But um, you know I, I I met you at the at the House of Lords and the a Palace of Westminster on the River Thames. And you grew up in Limehouse, just along the river, that same river. And I see you tweeting quite a lot from, you know, river views. And uh, your tweets are, are wonderfully inspiring. And you talk a lot about hope, as you did at the beginning. And I think, gosh, you know, you, you've done so much in your life. But actually, you're, you're still on that same river. Do you, do you sort of think about the, the kind of circularity of that often? Yeah, I do. Um, and, and that's a brilliant word, the circularity. Everything comes full circle. It is only, it is only in, in the beginning of an ending that we see beginnings for their true colour, their true vibrancy. It, it's only when we're leaving something do we finally record it uh, as it is. Um, and it was Paul that brought me back home. Um, I, I would never have ended up here in this apartment. He did a he did a little trick, and uh, I ended up back here. I often walk along this street, and I remember my mum trudging off to work at 
four o'clock in the morning. Uh, my dad coming home as a docker, sometimes coming home drunk with his his dad. Um, me and my brothers scampering along where the world seemed the most exciting and uh, and huge place in which to live. Um, and I often see the young me down on that muddy beach, uh, and I look down and I think, wow, what a journey, what a journey. Mm. I've been lucky. I've had an unimaginable life, and what's really changed me is Paul. Mm. Um, to have been so loved, uh, and to finally know that I was worthy of being loved um, means that, like today, it's the uh, the sixth anniversary of his cremation, um, and I, I physically miss him every single day. Uh, but it is love that sustains you. It's love that 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 carries on. I, I have this, this thing that I say, love doesn't exist in the past tense. Someone can't say I don't love you anymore because once loved, you're changed. The person who loves you is changed. And so when they die or when they go, the fact that you continue, I say, as I laugh, so he too will laugh. As I cry, so he too will cry. And that is why, Caroline, when I see the sun setting over the city there. I don't see the end of a day. As I said earlier, I see a day beginning elsewhere. Um, and it's the best way to live with hope and changed by love. I, I hope that everybody watching this has realised what I meant when I said this book has a, a wonderfully entertaining, but it has a beautiful beating heart, um, which you've just described so well. What are you most proud of? <laughs> um, well, taking Paul out of the equation, because uh, that will always be uh, with me. It, it's, um, it's something that happened when I was in the European Parliament. Uh, there was a young Iranian who applied for um, asylum. And the recommendation was that this gay uh, Iranian would be, should be sent back. It had been covered in the press. And, um, and I intervened along with a small group of others uh, to ask Jackie Smith, the then Home Secretary, to do the right thing and, and allow him to remain, to give him asylum. Um, and he was allowed to remain. Um, that young man who, if he'd been sent back to Iran, um, could have been, like other young teenagers were at that time, hung by his neck in a public square until he was dead for no other reason than whom he chooses to love. Um, and that's, I think, the thing during my political life that I'm proudest of. Oh, Michael, thank you so, so much. It's been such a Massive oh. honour and pleasure to talk to you again. And uh, my only regret is that you're not you're not here with us. But maybe maybe in future, who knows? But but thank well, you, Caroline. I've I've kept this, and this is very unusual for me. I've kept this right at the side until the very <laughs> end, because we did say when we meet up, we'd have a drink. Thank you so so much again. Um, a reminder that you can buy a copy of Michael's utterly enthralling a wonderful memoir one of them from our festival booksellers Stroud Bookshop stroudbookshop.com uh, we urge you to buy it either from them or from your local independent bookseller during this very difficult time for independent retailers if you've enjoyed this event and you'd like to support Stroud Book Festival please uh, consider donating what you might have paid for your ticket tonight details of how to do this are on our website stroudbookfestival.org.uk Tomorrow, on the final day of Stroud Book Festival, how did that come round so fast? Um, we present another terrific morning of events for children and families, including a Children's Botanica family quiz with Christopher Lloyd. There's still just about time to register for that via our website. 
Uh, we also have our festival reading group, um, discussion of Andrea Levy's marvellous novel, Small Island. We'll also be bringing you events with Rachel Joyce and Raina Wynne, and this year's winner of the Wayne White Prize for Nature Writing, 16-year-old Dara McAnulty. And in our festival finale tomorrow night, I'll be in conversation with Helen MacDonald, author of the multi-award winning H is for Hawk, about her utterly marvellous new collection of essays, Vesper Flights. For now, it's good night from Stroud Book Festival. <laughs>